All right. I think we're live. Okay. <laughs> I get to say hello to our viewers. Uh, this is Meta Spencer in Toronto. And I have a very interesting guest speaker. I'm going to actually talk entirely with him today. Uh, his name is Alex Duval, and he is the uh, president or chair or something of the executive director. <laughs> your executive director of the World Peace Foundation, which, as I have recently learned, is uh, based at Tufts University um, and has been for a long time. There's a whole history about it. So I'm so del delighted that you're here uh, with us, Alex. Uh, he, I should add, has is the author of a marvelous book that I'm half or two thirds through. Um, twiddle it, tw twiddle it around a little bit. So there you go. You get there to the title. Well. There you go. The history and famine of and failure and future of famine. Alex Duval, and it's called Mass Starvation. The main title. And who's a publisher? Polity Press. Oh yeah, well they do everything good, don't they? <laughs> All right, well it's, uh, it's good to have you here. And um, I would like to start off by uh, asking you first uh, just a bit about the World Peace Foundation. It's such an impressive title, my God. Could you ask for anything more um, uh, uh, high sounding than to be the Executive Director of the World Peace Foundation, that's almost being as good as being Secretary General of the UN. <laughs> so the, the World Peace Foundation was, was set up in, in July of 1910 by a Boston-based publisher called Edwin Ginn. And Ginn was um, a, he, he started life as a, a main farm boy. He was educated in one of those little farm schools that um, taught for only a few months in the year and became, uh, first of all, a book distributor and then a publisher. And his publishing was um, famous at the, the time for two things. The first was the commercial innovation of actually having uh, in-house production right, from, right the way through from editing to printing and distribution within one building. He had a building. Uh, on, on Memorial Drive, called the, um, which is subsequently called the Athena Building, which is still standing, which was his, his publishing house. And he was also well known because he felt that educational textbooks should not just be for learning by rote, but should be for broadening the mind. So he got the leading thinkers of the day to write uh, introductions to his, his history and literature and, 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 and politics textbooks. And, and, and revolutionized the, the textbook publishing industry and made, made himself a, a small fortune. So he wasn't as wealthy by any means as his, as his friend Andrew Carnegie. But I like to remind my friends in the Carnegie Foundation that every dollar was ethically earned. <laughs> selling, you know, publishing and selling textbooks is, is, is a very morally sound way of, 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 of making money. And, <laughs> And he, his initial idea was to actually set up a university for peace, the International School of Peace in Boston, with Carnegie. But Carnegie pulled out. And so instead, he set up a more modest venture, but with an immodest title called the World Peace Foundation, which he endowed with his will. He died in January of 1914. He gave it a million dollars. And that million dollars is, is our endowment up to now. So it, it's, it's, it's grown in size to about 20 million. So it's a modest in, endowment, um, certainly compared with the likes of, 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 of Carnegie, but enough to keep a small um, enterprise going. And the World Peace Foundation, I mean, there's, there are a few interesting nuggets from its history. One of them was that the definition that Ginn and his fellow trustees at the time had of world peace was the resolution of international disputes through arbitration and the establishment of a world organization. And he thought that was well within reach. And in many ways, he was actually right. I mean, the League of Nations was set up and the United Nations. And actually, interstate disputes are relatively rare. Now, what he had in mind at that point was to be able to deal with interstate disputes. That's right. So it was, it, was, it was a narrower definition of world peace than one we would have today. And because it was narrow, he, he actually wrote into the, 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 
statutes that every year the trustees of his bequest should meet and decide, vote whether world peace has been achieved or not. Because when it has, then we would be deprived of our money. It would go instead, for the char- it would go instead to the Charles Bank home for the working women of, of, of Boston. I'm and, sorry, but I have to laugh. I, and so the, the, the working women of Boston have been, wa- late, have been waiting for. A, um, shall we take a vote this year as to whether we have achieved world peace? Um, How do you vote for that? <laughs> well, I... I I, I don't get a vote. I, I would have a conflict of interest. <laughs> and, uh, but it means that for, for 108 years, they have been voting and, and the, the vote has gone 108 times, of course. There has been no, well, not been achieved. And in the meantime, of, of course, our definition, our understanding of world peace has broadened considerably. So the World Peace Foundation was, was from the beginning an educational foundation. It was dedicated to educating the peoples of the world about the evils and horrors of war and preparation for war. And so it was the main publisher and distributor for League of Nations material in the 1920s. It convened um, American uh, public thinkers and and political scientists to um, talk about and promote ideas for the United Nations during World War II, um, started the journal International Organization after World War Two and so on, and um, and came in, came, it's an independent foundation, but and we have had now for seven years an exclusive association with Tufts University, where I also am a faculty member. So, okay, so you teach peace studies at? Uh, That's at- right. Yes, I. Mm-hmm. So I um, so I teach, and then I I, I I run the foundation. In fact, I had the option, I mean, functionally, I'm actually a foundation president, but it seemed a little grandiose to call myself president of the World Peace Foundation. Well, I, I, I would vote for you as, as that. And I am myself somebody who ran a peace and conflict studies program mm. at the University of Toronto in the Mississauga campus. Mm. So I'm surprised that we we didn't bump into each other in some of these mm. confabs that, yes. that people and, have. And, and actually, just one, one more point. We had a, uh, the, when I came on board seven years ago, we had a debate with the board. And because some of the board members were beginning to feel, is this title world peace? Is it, you know, do people take us seriously? You know, when you talk about world peace, people tend to smirk and think you have to be, you know, a practitioner of levitation or a beauty queen or something like that. And I'm obviously neither of those two things. But um, I was, I was very keen on keeping the title because I felt that there are a whole host of problems in the world which are amenable to solutions. I mean, we can eradicate diseases. We eradicated smallpox. We're you know, well on the way to eradicating polio. We can control HIV and AIDS. We could eradicate world hunger, as we will talk about. Why can't we achieve world peace? And perhaps it's a, you know, it sounds a slightly anomalous or anachronistic title, but Let's keep it there, partly because of the legacy, partly because we want people to believe, actually, this is something that can be achieved. It's not, it's no laughing matter. It may actually be the single most important um, issue before us today. And actually, the, I mean, in the days of Edwin Ginn over a century ago, the threats to world peace came from you know, great powers fighting one another. Would France fight Germany? Would Japan fight Russia? Today, the, those aren't the most pressing pre- threats to world peace. The most pressing threats are, are things like climate change, are things like the disruption and despoilation of the public sphere by um, fake news and the hacking of, of on, and the deliberate manipulation of, of media platforms and, and things like that. And I think the, you know, there are global planetary threats to us as a species and to our, our whole globe, to, to our habitability. And world peace, I, I would think we need to redefine as the basis for having a reasoned global conversation about how we overcome those threats. And therefore, if we define world peace in that way, I would say it's actually a precondition for facing problems like, like climate change, like r- runaway um, accumulation of, of global hypercapitalism, like the, the the arms the arms business and the desperate corruption that accompanies the arms business, which n- not only leads to violent conflict but also 
corrodes democracy, undermines democracy in, in, in the shrinking spaces that we have as, as, as believers in democracy. And these sorts of things are only possible if we're not fearful of one another, not suspicious of one another, so that we don't go around subverting one another. And so I think that is one way of, of, of approaching the challenge of world peace today. Oh, you were saying what is, is music to my ear because I've been on a soapbox for the last year or so, uh, 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 even longer, uh, uh, arguing that in fact these, these global, some of these global problems, the most serious threats are ones that are interdependent and really form a system, you know, they're all interlinked and can can really best be, if, if possibly only be, uh, resolved by uh, some sort of comprehensive program. So we are like-minded. We clearly want to have another conversation about this sometime after you get from back from England. I think you're going off for a, right. a trip to England in a, in a few minutes. So I better get down to business. Tell me a little bit about, uh, I've just heard from somebody who used to know you that you were, you were, uh, rattling around London uh, uh, 20 or so years ago uh, uh, on a return home from a long stay in Africa mm -hmm. where you've been working on famine and from your book which I'm reading now, wonderful book uh, I, I infer that that is where you got your current version of um, a solution or a, an approach to, to famine as, um, uh, um, a, as uh, something that you we should all be handling. Can you can you tell me a little bit about your experiences in Africa and how how you came to think the way you do about this issue? Well, I, I started working on this topic in in, in Africa in the nineteen eighties um, in Sudan in in, in a, a famine that was in Western Sudan in, in, in Darfur that later on became famous or infamous for for, for massacre and war. In but when, when I was there in the, in, in the 1980s, it was desperately poor, economically stricken by, by crisis and mismanagement, and then further stricken by drought, and that caused a, a famine. And it, but the, the, the core research that I did at the time revealed to me really just the, the impressive capabilities, the resources, the knowledge, of the local people of Darfur, the farmers, the livestock herders, the local artisans, their cap capacity for withstanding famine. This was something, these were adversities that they were accustomed to and, and, and they were much more, they were much, they were the real experts at, get, at getting through these crises. But then shortly afterwards, there was another famine in Southern Sudan. And one of the things that was really disturbing about that well, the most striking thing was that the two famines were very, very different. And the, and the most striking difference was that in the second famine, the famine in South Sudan, which was man-made, it was made by war. There was no, um, and I would say man-made, there are no woman-made famines. These are very much man-made phenomena. It, and, and it was made by, by war and forcible dispossession, by looting, by ravaging, by, by, by destroying the basis of, of, of society. Um, in, in pursuit of counterinsurgency and forcibly displacing people. And the death rates that were in that famine were far, far higher. They weren't just twice as high or five times as high. In the worst places, they were 80 or 90 times as high Ooh. as in the previous famine. So the previous famine was pretty bad. This one was in a different gig. And I began to realize that in, in circumstances of, of war and deliberate oppression of this type, the verb to starve is transitive. It's something that people do to each other. Um, it, it's not simply a matter of, of, of going hungry. And one of the things that I try and do in this book, and let me hold up the cover and then explain why I chose this cover. Um, the, um, the, the, the first cover that the publishers proposed to me had pictures of hungry African children on it and withered landscapes. And I think if we, if we think you know, if, if we ask or if you do a Google search for, for famine, what you will get is pictures of dry landscapes, withered crops and hungry African children. But the, 
And, and then if you do a Google search for, for genocide or mass atrocity, you'll get pictures of, of death camps, of gas chambers, maybe of, of, of Rwandese militiamen with, 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 with machetes and so on. And these, these two images, as it were, inhabit different parts of our brain. And I wanted to make the argument that actually they should inhabit the same part of our brain. And I start with an, an, an epigram um, from, from um, uh, uh, Primo Levi's survival in Auschwitz about how the abiding experience of Auschwitz for the survivors was hunger. The, the, and indeed 500,000 of the, of the inmates of, of Auschwitz actually died of starvation. It was, I mean, more died in, in, in the gas chambers, but 500,000 people died of, 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 of starvation, of, of, of hunger. And actually, um, in World War II, uh, on the Eastern Front, the, 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 the Nazis had what they called the Hunger Plan, which was the plan to reduce the population of the former, of what was then the Soviet Union, by 30 million people through starvation in order to create space for their, their army and for their settlers to, to, to live, um, which would have been the biggest starvation crime ever in history. In fact, they didn't get to 30 million. They, they starved somewhere between five and six million, two and a half million prisoners of war, a million in land etc. et cetera, et cetera. Where were these, uh, these uh, mass starvations that uh, run by the Nazis? The, the, it, it, it's extraordinary that in, in our, in, in the, the, the narrative of the Second World War and, the, and, and our imagery and our sort of collective consciousness about the, the Holocaust and the Second World War, mass starvation really is not there as no. uh, one of the primary crimes, even though it killed millions and millions. And had the hunger plan been pursued to its conclusion, it would have been the biggest killer by far. In fact, hung, in, in World War II, hunger killed about as many people as died from violence. Now, the reason I argue why it wasn't criminalized in Nuremberg and wasn't made into the atrocity that it, that it warrants is that we, the Allies, did it too. At the end of World War I, the British starved Germany, and they continued starving Germany even after the armistice in, in, in November of 1918, mm. until the Germans signed the Versailles Treaty. And that cost several hundred thousand lives of German children who were starved to death during that winter and spring. And in World War II, there were allied famines, in, most notoriously in, in, in Bengal, in India, which was a famine created not deliberately by the British, but it was created because they, the British feared a, a Japanese invasion of India. And so they impounded the fishing boats, they controlled the food supply, and they mismanaged the economy in a way that created a famine. And then they did nothing to relieve it, and it cost several million lives. And then at the end of the war, and in, right in the middle of 1945, before the war in the Pacific came to its very sudden end, and the US was expecting a protracted conflict, the US Army Air Force was, was dropping mines into Japanese harbors in order to seal off Japan from imports of food. And they called it Operation Starvation. So it is not surprising that in the Norum, when it came to Nuremberg, the Allied prosecutors were not going to prosecute German war criminals for starvation of crime. And the, the idea that famine should be seen as a mass atrocity, you know, comparable to these acts of genocide, was not put in our collective imagination, despite the fact that there is a long history of um, famine being inflicted as a military tool, a tool of counterinsurgency, and indeed a political tool. Here in the United States, hunger was one of the main ways in which the, 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 um, the British and then the US Army and the settlers, and also in, in, in Canada, um, dispossessed native people. So it was a, a mechanism for genocide in, in, in Australia, in, in Southwest Africa, the genocide of the Hereros in 1904, was achieved by driving people into the desert where they starved to death. Now, this isn't to say that all famines are like this. It's to say that there is a continuum of famine between genocidal famines like mm -hmm. this 
through famines of recklessness and disregard, like the Bengal famine or the, the famines of, of the Mao Zedong in, in, in China, the greatest famine of the 20th century called tens of millions of, caused the deaths of tens of millions of people through forced collectivization. Um, all the way through to famines that occur through um, neglect and incompetent economics and so on, which is what happened in, 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 in Darfur in, 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 in the drought famine that I studied in the 1980s. So there's a spectrum. And so instead of a, a picture of starving African children, I wanted a, a picture of which had, a, as it were, an empty plate that could be anywhere in the world. And the barbed wire there reflects the fact that the, 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 the emptiness of the plate comes about through human action. And when I talk about starvation in the book, I talk about it in the transitive sense. This is an act that people do to one another. And then the last thing I want to say about the title is that when I started working on this book about three years ago, it looked as though famine could, have, could be abolished. It was within our grasp, the, the total eradication of famine. Sadly, tragically, during the writing of it, famine made a comeback. Um, in a number of places, and most notoriously, most horribly in Yemen. So I had to add an extra chapter about the, the future mm -hmm. of the family. Yeah, and, and that is the, the impression that I get is you think there's a real possibility of a resurgence, not just at the moment, but um, in, in a big sense. Um, unfortunately, that is the case. I mean, in, I, in looking at the big sweep of famine o, o, over history, we see it in different acts. We have the famines of colonial conquest and the forcible incorporation of, of third world peoples in India, in, in China, in, in Latin America, into the global capitalist economy at the end of the 19th century, what the geographer Mike Davis calls the late Victorian Holocaust. We have the famines of the of the extended world war, of World War One, of, of, of um, Soviet collectivization of the civil wars in China, of World War II, of the Nazi hunger plan. Those total the, 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 the famines of total war. We have the post-colonial totalitarian famines of Mao and of Pol Pot. And then we have a vicious but smaller famines in, in Africa and, and, and the Middle East of the last 30 years. But what is really impressive, actually, is if we look over the last 30 years, which is actually more or less my, the span of my career of studying this, how effective the, the international humanitarian order has been in reducing famines and particularly reducing their lethality. When I was first working in, 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 in Sudan in the 1980s, you saw these famine camps and outrageous levels of mortality both due to lack of food, also poor sanitation, infectious diseases. And today, in comparable circumstances, the international agencies, the likes of UNICEF, the World Food Programme, Save the Children, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, actually, they have both the technology and the professionalism and now the capacity for hugely reducing the numbers of people who die. And so the, this is a huge success, and it's not something that, people like us tend to celebrate. We tend to only look at the immediate problems. We don't tend to step back and say, hey, something tremendously positive has been achieved over the lifespan of a, genera no, of a generation. But we, I think we need to do that because what is happening is we're seeing this positive trend turn around. We're seeing famine mortality going up mm -hmm. and we are seeing- um, And for political reasons always for political reasons. So if we look at the, um, a, a, just over a year ago, 18 months ago, the UN talked about four imminent famines. One was in Northern Nigeria. And the immediate cause of that was a war between the extremist group Boko Haram and the Nigerian government. And the Nigerian government, by far the more powerful actor, was just as bad as Boko Haram, the extremist group, in depriving people of food. In South Sudan, a vicious group. Sorry, but I, I, I don't know that story. What were they doing? The, the, the Nigerian government was trying to starve the Boko Haram themselves. Were they clustered someplace where they could? There was, a, a, in, in, in the Boko Haram insurgency is, is based in the, in the northeast of Nigeria. 
-hmm. and and it controlled at that time an area of more than where more than a million people were were living and the the counterinsurgency included blocking all trade and all relief going into the area controlled by Boko Haram. So that while Boko Haram is undoubtedly the major culprit, the Nigerian counterinsurgency was making matters worse in that specific respect. So they weren't just starving the Boko Haram, they would have to starve the population that exactly. Boko Haram controlled, I see. Yeah. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. That's something needs publicity, it sounds it like. It's very little publicity. Yeah. And then in South Sudan, there was a, still is a terrible civil war ongoing in which both sides are using scorched earth, displacing people, blocking humanitarian relief, closing markets, doing all sorts of terrible things and creating famine conditions. Mm -hmm. In Somalia, there was a, a famine in 2011 where um, a, a number of different factors came together, including a drought, including a spike in the price of food, including war. But the particularly culpable factor was that the US government, the then administration of Barack Obama, um, used the Patriot Act, which prohibits material assistance to any body who is identified as a state sponsor, uh, as, as a terrorist organization, which includes the, the extremist group Al-Shabaab any material support, deliberate or inadvertent, of any, on any scale, which meant that any, anyone who's done humanitarian relief in these circumstances knows that if you are providing assistance to the general population, some of it will go into the hands of, of controlling authorities, militiamen, etc. Some of it, it can't be avoided. It's just no one has ever worked out a way of making humanitarian relief utterly watertight. But on the, on the basis that this is, was the case, humanitarian agencies were informed that they risked prosecution under the, the Patriot Act if they were to operate in Somalia in, in, in a way that had even the smallest danger of food falling into the hands. Even or, international uh, humanitarian organizations? Even that, even what about the Red Cross? Anybody. Okay. Um, now, those who, um, who, 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 were felt who, who could find a way of getting beyond the reach of the, um, the US could do it, so some Islamic agencies and so on. And it took, and, and many of the senior aid officials and diplomats in the US government said, this is crazy. We will be seen as, not only as, as, as actually causing many deaths, but, but this is not going to do our reputation any good if we want to do counter-terrorism and counter-extremism. But it took eight months for the Department of Justice and the Department of, of Trade, which administers the, the, the foreign uh, assets um, prohibitions, to find a, a humanitarian workaround, which they now have. Mm. But it took all that, that time and that delay contributed to a famine that cost probably 200, 250,000 lives. So that was a terrible stain on the record of that previous administration. And it indicates that there was a priority that overrode the humanitarian priority. Mm -hmm. Counterterrorism, we can tolerate famine in the name of counterterrorism. Basically, that's the message. And the message was also there in, 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 in Syria in, in, during the current uh, crisis in, in, in Syria. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, but the last year's famine in, or near famine in Somalia was really a legacy of that because as a result of the, the, all the losses of livelihoods and assets and the weakening of society that happened seven, six, seven years previously, people were desperately vulnerable. So even though the humanitarians actually pulled out all the stops last year in Somalia, people were still desperately hungry. And in fact, they had, the, the international humanitarians adopted a principle that they called no regrets programming. They didn't want that 2011 calamity to happen again. And it worked, but they did actually manage to. Who, who, who was behind this no regrets program? This was as using this humanitarian workaround. Yes, we, we don't mind if 
um, or we will turn a blind eye to very small amounts of assistance falling into the hands of Al-Shabaab. But it's worth it if we can actually prevent a famine and save hundreds of thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. So they, they call that no regrets program. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It showed that if you actually prioritize humanitarian assistance in this complicated situation, you can avert a famine. And I'm sure there are some Al-Shabaab fighters who are fed as a result. But it, did it do any good for Al-Shabaab? It did a lot of good for the internationals. It, it made the international reputation, it salvaged a lot of the reputation of the international community in Somalia, that, that approach. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the, I mean, I'm not a, I don't need to be a spokesperson for, for counterterrorism, but I think if you are going to do counterterrorism, this is, this is surely the way to do it, rather than saying, if one aspirin or one bag of food falls into the hands of these people, we will now. Yeah, can, can, can we say that what support um, the US is giving to the Saudis now has any influence on the hunger in, uh, or the famine in, in uh, Yemen? I think Yemen is really the scam. Yemen is the, the famine that will define our generation. Um, because Yemen was poor. Yemen was dependent on food imports. Yemen was uh, an, an area that had great water scarcity. And everybody who launched that war in Yemen, a war of choice, three and a half years ago, knew that. They knew that Yemen was vulnerable. And over three and a half years, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and their um, suppliers and facilitators, the United States, the UK, France, have made that war, made it possible for the Saudis and the Emiratis to, to prosecute that war without regard for um, the destruction of an entire country. Now, what we tend to hear about are the really shocking cases, you know, the, the bombings of school buses, the bombings of markets, um, the, the, the bombings of health facilities, and those are absolutely scandalous. We also hear about the attack on, on this port, al Hudaida, which is the main lifeline for not only humanitarian food, but commercial food coming into the country. And these are all elements that create hunger and deprivation and, 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 and starvation. What we hear a lot less about is the overall dismantling of the economy, so that there is a, a sort of an economic war going on in Yemen, which involves basically dismantling the entire artisanal fishing industry along the Red Sea. And the reason for that, I mean, there's a the security reason, is the fear that the Houthi rebels that control um, these ports will use these fishing boats to attack shipping in, 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 mm -hmm. in the Red Sea. But um, there's probably also commercial reasons because the, the, the Emiratis are interested in, in, in controlling the um, the fishing themselves, to be frank, and, and, and controlling the ports that line up all the ports in this part of the world. Um, we see the, the, the closing of the central bank, the, the stopping of all payments to, to civil servants, and the closing of, a, of what was previously a very extensive social welfare system. So that um, journalists who have been reporting from Sana'a, the, the Yemeni capital, will describe how the the families whose children you see in feeding centers, they're not the people you would see in, 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 a, in a famine in, say, Nigeria or Somalia. They're not the poorest of the poor. They're often the children of, of school teachers or local government officials who were reliant on, on a salary. And then for three years, that no salary at all. And so they simply don't have the means to, um, to, feed, um, to, feed, to feed their children. And so the dismantling of the... the key aspects of the economy, the closing of markets, the closing of the industry, what industry there was, has meant that, that, that an entire nation is, is sort of walking into the state of, of, of deprivation and hunger. And because we don't have very good data, because international agencies are not able to, to get access to all the places and all the information about to, to collect the data about malnutrition, about death rates. We really don't know what is going on, but we have to fear for the worst. You know, I would like to focus a little bit, change the focus to 
pointing out something that is not well recognized, and, and that is that famine is not just or primarily a matter of food production and access uh, uh, access to, to food, but it's access in a different sense. People don't have the money or don't have the jobs or don't have uh, opportunities to, to obtain the food, even if food is there. Mm. And I, I, I think that that is something that an average assumption people would make is that that famine is a result of a failure to produce good crops um, because of weather or um, something of that kind. And I, you know, your book makes it very clear that that is not the way to look at it. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. I mean, of course, sometimes you do get famines that are caused by massive failures of, of, of food supply and food production. But quite a lot of the, 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 the famines that we've seen, and particularly the more recent, the more modern famines, it's, it's remarkable how food is available. And the great Indian uh, economist Amartya Sen, who grew up in, in Calcutta in Bengal during the famine of the 1940s, was struck at the time growing up how there were starving people on the streets and yet there was food in the market. It's simply that the, the people who were starving had no income, they had no way of buying that. They were unemployed because their fishing boats had been impounded or because they, um, they'd been thrown out of work for one reason or another. And then the price of food also went up with a speculative spiral. So that people were starving, even though there was uh, plenty of food available. And this is quite a common phenomenon. It was very striking in, in the great Irish famine of the 1840s, that even while a million people in Ireland starved to death because they had no food of their own, their own local small potato crops had failed and, and um, they, they didn't have food from, they didn't have income from being able to, to work as laborers. Ireland was still exporting food. The large landowners were, were growing and harvesting grain and exporting it to the cities of, of, of Britain at the time. And this is quite a common phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, so it's important to recognize that, yes, we can have extreme hunger, we can have um, even famine, even without a, a, a shortage of food, even when um, food is available. And even in Yemen today, the food imports have, including smuggling of food, has meant that until very, very recently, there was actually quite a lot of food in the market. It's just simply people did not have uh, mm -hmm. that money with which to buy it. Mm -hmm. Another point that, that you make that I, I think is um, worth emphasizing is that most of the people who die uh, in a famine uh, don't necessarily starve to death directly, but uh, die of disease. Uh, and, and the, um, you know, we're working on uh, linkages between six global threats. And the, I was aware that, of course, uh, people who are in states of famine are uh, more vulnerable to pandemics. But I didn't realize that, in fact, that it accounts for such a large proportion of, of the deaths. Can, can, um, can you speak to that again? Well, it's, um, famine is, 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 a, is, is not just a lot of individuals going hungry. It's a whole social disruption. It's, it, 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 it's the tearing apart of a social fabric. And one of the things that, that, that happens is that people move and they, and, and they look for work, they look for, for, for food. And one of the things that we, that we see yeah. these big concentrations of people in, in, in camps, in displaced camps, in squatter settlements, etc., who have left the places where they normally live to go and, and, and congregate around large cities looking for work or, or, or for charity. And these places can be hotbeds of disease. They, they can be very un, un, unsanitary where disease, waterborne diseases can, can, can spread. Infectious diseases will, can, can, can run riot through these populations very, very rapidly. And of course, also then affect the people who, who, um, who are not hungry. So, and, and of course, people who are hungry are also more, more susceptible to, um, to many of these infectious diseases. So we get this vicious spiral of, 
of, of, of hunger and disease interacting with, uh, with mm -hmm. one another. I remember one time when I was in grade 12, a sociology class in California, uh, a, a fellow student, a young woman, said something that horrified me and I couldn't answer her. She, uh, we were someplace in the world, there was a famine going on and we were talking about sending relief of various kinds. And she said, no, 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 there's no point in doing that because if you just, if you keep those people alive, they're just gonna have more babies and next year it's gonna be twice as hard to solve the problem. Let them die now. And I thought, Jesus, <laughs> wow. And, and I didn't know how to answer her. And it was only several years later that I ran across Malthus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you do a beautiful job of talking about Malthus and the impact that he is still having today in the thinking that goes on in public discourse uh, and maybe even professional uh, people working on, on humanitarian aid. Uh, can, can, you, uh, can you give us a little course on, on Malthus and where he went wrong? Well, Mal I mean, Malthus's core argument, which he articulated in his first essay on the principle of population, which was published in 1798, he, he believed that the agricultural productivity, food production would go up um, arithmetically, one, two, three, four, five, whereas the population size would go up geometrically, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and therefore population size would outstrip food and this would cause a crisis inevitably. Overpopulation would cause a crisis. Now, what's very interesting about Malthus' own writings is actually that he, he wrote the, that as a sort of philosophical treatise, and then it was much more successful than he expected, and he began to do the research, the actual empirical research, and he actually dropped that particular argument. He, when he began to investigate families, as they occurred, he dropped that he was still very interested in, 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 in population and political economy, but he no longer made the claim that famine would actually be what he called initially a natural corrective to population. But the idea has lived on. I call it a zombie concept. It's a concept that however often you kill it off still comes back to torment the living. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and if you look at the, at, the, at the timeline of world population and famines, what you see over the last 150 years is that the um, world population has gone up by a factor of about five in, in, in the last century. And mortality due to famines has dropped to about 5%. So population is going up, famine mortality is going down. And that is even the case in countries that were seen as the... the emblems of the Malthusian hypothesis, like India. Famines have basically been abolished from India since some people would say from the 1940s, others from the 1970s. Ethiopia, the Ethiopian population has gone up hugely. Famines have, 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 have virtually vanished from Ethiopia. Now, I think the, 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 the reason for this um, is, is, is that food, staple food production is only a small part of the economy and only a small part of the overall impact of human activity on the planetary environment. Staple food production. We could feed many tens of billions of people if people were to eat a diet of, 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 of rice and wheat and vegetables and maybe chickens and, 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 and other sources of protein. If, if we're all going to be meat eaters, it's a different story. If we're all going to be beef, then the, we need several extra planets to grow our, um, from which our, our, our cows can destroy rainforests and munch grass. Right, and I, I still have to remind you that we've got these vats coming along and they're, they're uh, culturing beef already. So we don't have to have them out on the range. Well, let, let's hope there is a, a, a technological solution to our, our insatiable appetite for, for beef. But the, the the real problem is 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 not um, is not food in, in in terms of the 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 or not staple food in terms of our overall ecological footprint or in terms of, of, of where the pressure point comes in, in the impact of resources 
of resource scarcity on, on, on human populations. And the, the, each of the famines that have been occurring have been occurring for uh, political reasons. Now, let us say that um, climate change brings major ecological and economic stresses, as seems unfortunately inevitable now. But there will be parts of the world, like, like Bangladesh, for example, um, which are under extreme stress because of climate change. Now, will those cause famines? If they do cause famines, it will be because we collectively have taken the political decision that the burden of hardship and hunger should fall there and not there. We, we are perfectly capable of handling these stresses in a more equitable manner so that people have at least enough to eat and, 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 and have a decent life. The world economy is, under any scenario, perfectly capable of doing that. Okay, I, I, I am uh, relieved to be able now, I think I could go back and talk to that high school student and give her a much better answer than I did at the time. Uh, but I'm surrounded by people who have, who share some of those, they wouldn't put it so crudely, but certainly there is uh, a fear that uh, population increase will require uh, us to produce more food than can be produced. Mm. That's apart from the fact that we may be using other resources that are more mm. finite and uh, cannot be expended so easily. So I think um, the concern, I, I have some reservations about the, the concern there. Um, now, could you please give us a solution, Paula? I mean, if we've got the prospect of other uh, continuation and resumption of famines because um, nations or uh, terrorist organizations like Boko Haram or, uh, uh, or, or even the countries um, that are fighting Boko Haram, if, if, they, if they see the potential for using famine as a weapon of war and, and are not called on it, um, as they seem to be, for example, they're, they're still getting away with it when it comes to blocking that harbor in Yemen. I believe that uh, then what are we going to do about it? Um, how, uh, how can we work on as peace people work on reducing the um, possibility of using famine um, as a weapon uh, deliberately causing it in war or in conflicts? I'm actually quite encouraged on this score. Um, and let me give a, three reasons, really. One is, first of all, when I, when I started, when I was researching and writing the, the section of this book on the criminalization of famine, on international law, on prohibiting starvation, the lawyers I spoke to were fairly downbeat. They said, no, you know, basically it is still lawful to, to inflict starvation. There's not much we can do about it. In fact, in the last year, 18 months, that conversation has really moved. And I think what happened was that not so much that the law has changed, but that the lawyers who work on this began to see actually other areas of relevant law have changed. And, and, and we can, as we hitch the laws prohibiting starvation to that moving train. And, and the law prohibiting starvation is a lot stronger than, than thought. And so there are efforts underway, and I'm involved in some of them, to see how we could bring charges of, of starvation crimes against those responsible for the famine in Yemen, for example, or in South mm -hmm. Sudan. Mm -hmm. Now, the second point is that we have seen tangible progress. There was a UN Security Council resolution a couple of months ago um, on, on uh, armed conflict and food security that made it very clear that uh, starvation of civilians in wartime should be considered a war crime. And, and, and I think that reflects this, uh, this, the, this push. But the third point I want to make is that um, I came to, I, I made these arguments in, in, in a rather, I must say, initially despairing way um, 
um, a year ago, thinking that with the administration we have in Washington, with the general trend to disregarding international law, these sorts of sensibilities wouldn't get much resonance. I was wrong. There's actually, across the political spectrum, there is an appetite for saying, this is wrong. This is something that, um, that, that, that really ought not to be allowed. And even in this current um, administration in Washington, there are key people, the, the, the Nikki Haley at the United Nations, people at the National Security Council who say, no, you know, what, what is being done in, by people we don't like, like the Syrian, Syrian government, even by people who are allies like the Saudis and the Emiratis is wrong and we ought to, um, we ought to stop it. But law itself is not the answer. Law is, as it were, a, 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 a tool the, the real change comes with public opinion. If it is, if acts of starvation are considered so morally reprehensible that they are unthinkable, that it is simply considered beyond the pale, so uncivilized, so barbaric to inflict starvation on a community, on women and children, on, or, or on an entire nation, as in Yemen, then um, when we have that kind of popular outcry against it, then we will stop it. And then when we do get, you know, new threats emerging through economic crisis, through climate change, we will have the basis on, on, on which to prevent needless human suffering and death. Mm -hmm. Now, there, I, I was in touch uh, briefly with Hilal Elver, the UN rapporteur on the right to food. Now, if there's a rapporteur on the right to food, then the UN must somehow recognize that there is a right to food. Uh, is that part of the UN, uh, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or is it a resolution that was adopted, or where did, where did this notion come from that there is a right to food? Um, the right to food has been developed uh, um, over the years. The, the US in particular has been very reluctant to acknowledge it, as, as it doesn't like social and economic and cultural rights in, in in general, I think it's a, it, it's a a right that really needs to be given a lot more uh, teeth, and I think the the um, some of the progress on this parallel track of criminalising acts of starvation will be the means of, of, of making that right. Would you put criminalisation of starvation as a top priority for people working on famine? as a social issue. I would, I, I would. You know, that we have this effort to create a more comprehensive agenda for resolving global threats, which are so interdependent. And uh, I, I got the impression that you and a few other people who are writing on these, uh, uh, on these issues now are encouraging us to think of uh, making it a political campaign against um, the atrocities uh, that and and treating starvation as as an atrocity or as a war crime. Um, how would we go about that if you, if you were organizing a campaign? And let's think of organizing a campaign. How shall we do it? I think the the, the, the fundamental of the campaign has to be public opinion. I think it would be it, it, it's an error to make the law the goal. We need to. Um, we need to, to create an environment in which the law is catching up with public opinion rather than um, the other way around. Okay. But, but there are some key legal things that can be done. I think the, um, the, the recent Security Council resolution um, 2417 is, is an important step forward and, there, and the UN Secretary General has to report on that every year. So the, that report will be key. There's a, um, a, a proposal put forward by the Swiss to the Assembly of, of State Parties to the International Criminal Court, which will be debated in December, which is to broaden the crime of starvation within the, uh, the Rome Statute that, did, uh, that, 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 regular, that is the, the, the basis for the International Criminal Court. Um, and I think we could get... Let, let, let me, let me, uh, so let me understand that. You would then be able to take a case to the ICC charging somebody with war crimes at that level. On and the basis of starvation. Who would, who would be, 
empowered to make that kind of accusation or bring that charge? Well, the the the, um, the, the, the prosecutor of the ICC could do it on she could do it on 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 her own account, or she could do it in a, in a case that is referred by the UN Security Council, mm -hmm. um, or in the case in, in, in Africa the. The Constitutive Act of the African Union has a has a specific article that condemns what it calls grave um, breaches, which includes these crimes. So the, the it, it could be done um, through the African Union as well in, in, in the African continent. And of course, one can use universal jurisdiction in certain countries like France or Belgium to bring cases against um, individuals. So there are a number of legal avenues that, uh, uh, that could be pursued. But I think, of course, they would be chiefly symbolic. They would be pursued in order to get um, political capital and publicity rather than uh, expecting universal enforcement, um, um, which is why I, I would argue strongly that it really is uh, public opinion and political accountability, calling political leaders to account. Um, the key so that things like the humanitarian workaround for the Patriot Act, which which basically at the moment is simply an ad hoc mechanism for allowing humanitarian activities to continue in uh, circumstances where there is a terrorist organization operating. Those have to be formalized. We have to make it clear that saving the lives of large numbers of people threatened with famine is more important than the strict enforcement of counter-terrorist legislation. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, I'm inspired. Thank uh, you. I really have learned a lot, and I'm going to keep on reading your book, and I want everybody else to read it too. Okay. And uh, if I may, I, I uh, hope uh, it's okay with you if I edit uh, some of this and okay. present it as uh, sort of a transcript in Peace Magazine, which I edit. Okay, please, and and, and send and send me the links to to everything you put out on this. Oh, sure, we'll do. And I'll, I'll, of course, send you the draft uh, first to make sure I haven't misquoted you or something of that kind. Okay, well, I hope it, well, I hope it was relatively lucid anyway. It's been a uh, huge uh, pleasure and, and a treat to get to know you a little bit. Let's okay. continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.